So we're going to talk, I mean, it's a little bit different than what we have, the subjects that you see in the technical session. I'll be flying a much higher level, and we're going to talk about the environment in which what you produce actually ends up. So uh, first, a couple of housekeeping. Thank you for Professor Borshut, and uh, then my friend at uh, Alu Quebec, who made all of this possible. And then in order to compile the data that I actually used, I had to actually pull a lot of you know, favors from lots of friends in many parts of the industry, both automotive and aluminum. So I thank them. Can't name them all, there's too many of them. So the overview of what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to have a short introduction. We're going to talk about the history and the growth of auto body sheet. People have really, uh, don't, don't quite aware of what it is. And then we're going to talk about supply and consumption, on where, where does it take place, how does it fit within uh, North America. And then we're going to finally talk about what I really was interested in, was to try to understand the scrap flow. And if you read my abstract, I hope you did, uh, if you read my abstract, you'll discover that what I'll talk about is slightly different than the abstract, because when I, I did the abstract before I had finished the study, and once I had finished the study, I thought that maybe I needed to turn things around a little bit. So you'll see how it's different. Then we'll talk about recycling challenges, about all of this, and then we'll talk about a, some, some summary and conclusion. So, definitions first. Everybody knows about primary and secondary. I won't really spend too much time on that. But we will talk about uh, OEMs. Uh, I'll talk about OEM because it's a shortcut that we use, which simply means we talk about light vehicles manufacturers. That's what it means. As opposition to truck makers, buses makers, and things like that. Then the stamping scrap, stamping, pressing in England, stamping in the United States, that's the, and the scrap that is what is not part of the part, right? When I buy the metal, I make a part, what doesn't make the part is scrap. It doesn't mean that it's bad, it simply means that it was used to make the part, and then we, we, we're done with it, and we don't need it anymore. Also called it prompt scrap. Then tolling loop, this is a term that we use exclusively within the, uh, our little environment between us and the, uh, and the mill. It simply means that I take the stamping scrap and without any additional processing, I return it directly to a mill. The mill makes it back into sheet and comes back right to me, okay, as an automotive manufacturer. So that's a loop and we can make it cycle. ABS, auto body sheet, because it's too long to, to spell on the slides, so ABS, whenever you see ABS, and AABS sounded kind of bad, right? So it's aluminum ABS. Closures, anything that you attach that moves, close and move on the car, that is bolted to the car, so if it's the hood or the bonnet, it's the fenders or the wings, the doors, the trunk lids or the boot, and then the lift gate, tailgate at the end of the car. Body and white, it's a body before paint, before without the closures. And then EOS, it's end of service because my wife doesn't want to talk about end of life and the cars after all are not alive, right? So it's end of service for me. So the goals of the presentation, the first one is to describe the flow of aluminum auto body sheet into the scrap market. I mean, this is what I really wanted to, to, to understand when I started this study. The second one is to try to understand and explore and, and, and highlight the challenges for this, because when I talk about recycling, the whole point, you'll see the whole point, why do we use aluminum body sheet? We use aluminum body sheet to save fuel, right? And if I want to save fuel, that's to lower CO2 emission, and everybody knows making aluminum takes a lot of energy, right? So recycling is very important to me. So an overview is that the aluminum body sheet in the auto industry, I mean, this is old, guys. It has been in use for more than 100 years. Uh, Rob Sanders, who is in there somewhere, and I have been writing, uh, he's right there. We have been writing a series of articles from the American Society of Materials chronicling the development of auto body sheet in the, in the world. And the first edition is out. There's five more spots, so you can seek them out. The first one was 1899 to 1947, 1948, worldwide. So 1899 was actually the first vehicle with aluminum body sheet. Okay, so it's a long time ago. Moving from closures, to the body in white, this is what we're doing right now. Several alloys with marked com com uh, compositional differences because you know different goals, different composition. And then aluminum sheet, regardless of what anybody tells you, it's not, it's not in the bag. It's a premium material which is expensive from an automotive point of view and it's subject to absolutely fantastic competition from every single material that could that think that they can do the job. And the most serious one, of course, is the lower cost materials and uh, that's the guys from the advanced and ultra high strength steel that are convinced that they will one day be able to get rid of this pesky little material that tries to take their place. The near future, 
Well, as far as my crystal ball can tell, nobody is going to go pure material one way or the other. Okay, we're moving towards mixed materials when aluminum is used, but in general, if you look at the long term, the mass market, the family car, the affordable vehicle will remain steel. Steel is a phenomenal market, uh, phenomenal material that no one can actually ignore, and it's perfect for the car industry. So the drivers, as I mentioned, tightening CO2 regulation, emission, and the fuel economy regulation, the market is moving away from cars. What does it have to do with aluminum? Well, everybody now seems to want an SUV or CUV in, in, worldwide. It's, it's a phenomenon that started in the US, but has migrated to Europe, and it's uh, definitely in China. And it means that the vehicles are getting larger, the aerodynamic performance is falling, which means that meeting the fuel economy targets is more, getting more difficult. And one way to improve on that is, to, of course, to, to, remove, to take weight away. If you think about other aspect, of course, we've been complaining about this in the auto industry for, for a long, long time now, since the 1970s, but we have been upping the content in terms of safety and, and emissions for all for 40 years now. And if you think about, if you trend the, the, the weight gain of cars, it has been steady and inexorable. Luxury cars, what is a luxury car? Luxury car definition has changed, and it has now a lot of content in luxury cars, and that means that they're getting porky, they gain weight. Uh, performance, on the other hand, has to remain. So if you gain weight and you want to maintain performance, the only thing you can do is to try to use every trick in the book to lose weight, right? To avoid gaining more weight. And so you're going to lose aluminum sheet. And then, one thing that the steel industry doesn't want to know, and I love to remind them that, they have lost the war for skins. It's over. Because if they wanted to compete on weight for skins, a one millimeter aluminum sheet to meet it in steel would have to be a third of a millimeter. And there are many reasons why this is completely impractical. I won't go through them, but you can see them there. And it simply means that as far as skins, you can't beat aluminum. Carbon fiber can do it, but carbon fiber is quite expensive and it's difficult and it has all kinds of issues of its own. But, so aluminum is a fantastic solution for skins. All of this means that aluminum is increasing. Consumption in the auto industry is increasing. So I promised you an overview of history because we're deep into it with Rob. So we discovered a thing. So the first thing I'm gonna mention, we're not talking about a one-off. Everybody knows about the Ford Model T, and I've been referring to the Ford Model T as an ancestor of aluminum sheet usage, and I had it all wrong. It did not start with an aluminum hood, like I said, for 20 years. No, no. It started with a steel hood, but from serial number 2501, and I'm very precise, and I know the color of the car, the model of the car. It was a roadster. It was gray, and it left. And I don't know the date by heart, but I have the date somewhere. And it had an aluminum hood, and for the next eight years, the Model T had an aluminum hood. Okay. It was 1,000 series. 1923, look at the difference in body style between the 1909 and the 1923. This is now suddenly a four-door model. Do you think it's slight? No, it has gained tremendous amount of weight, and Henry hated weight gain. The car had the same low-power engine, performance was way down, and so what did they do? They put aluminum sheet on the body. 144,000 four-door were sold worldwide in 19, 1923, and it had aluminum body. Now, the construction was not sophisticated in 1923. The body was made of wood frame with sheet nailed to it, and if it was not aluminum, it was steel. But by God, 144,000 bodies with aluminum sheet. And Ford was not alone. I just simply used Ford because, you know, I have an emotional attachment to it after 30 years. So, well, you notice that some things disappear and, from the graph. These are things that are not retained, okay? So if something sticks on the graph, it means that it stays today, okay, until today. 5154 was a 5,000 series alloy, one of the first 5,000 that happened in the 30s. And then, right after the war, during the war, a, 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 a failing, you know, painful realization by a luxury car maker, Paul Vassor in France, realized that the post-war story would not be good for luxury handmade cars, and they decided to focus on a people's car, and they worked with a, a brilliant engineer in France, and, and the ancestor of Pechine, and they worked on an aluminum vehicle. And so in 1947, the Dynas X went into production. It was a steel underbody with cast structural members, a space frame kind of thing, and body, aluminum body sheet. And they used a 3% magnesium alloy called AG3. 
1948, of course, that's a famous and iconic Land Rover launches. It was supposed to just be a flash in the pan. Well, you know the story, it's still there. And they used an alloy called N4 that was from Northwest aluminum, or British aluminum, and it had 2% magnesium, 4 tenths of a percent of manganese. And then the first thing that broke, broke out of the uh, 5000 series alloys is the Citroën DS, back in France, back to Pechine. And they actually had a 2000 series alloy for the first time on the hood. And I grew up in a French-speaking environment next to France and everything, and I never knew that the DS had an aluminum hood. Okay? This is a guy who has lived for aluminum for more than 30 years. I never knew it had an aluminum hood. They make 1.5 million of those things with an aluminum hood. 5083, and this was a maritime alloy. It had nothing to do with the invention, had nothing to do with the auto industry, but we use it today for things that it was never envisioned to be used for when it was invented. It stays. 1954, Poir finally saw the, day, the light of day, and they decided that all these castings and all these mixed material crap didn't work out, and they made a full aluminum stamped structure. And this is the first all aluminum stamped classical aluminum uh, structure car. And they made a little mistake, we're not going to go into that. Uh, the aluminum story lasted one year and then they went back to steel. But, uh, and they, the company went bankrupt. Okay, so it was not an auspicious beginning for aluminum. But, uh, you know, it, it was a very, very audacious effort. And a lot of things were sorted out when we did that. 5082 comes out, and then 5182 finally appears, and it was used for cans and many other things, but the Porsche was the first one that I know of. Maybe I'm wrong. If somebody knows different, please contact me and I'll correct. Uh, used it for Doina uh, for the 928. 2036, 1970, this is when Reynolds Metal launches the first automotive designed alloy specifically for the US market. Notice that it was invented in 1970, but its first use was in 1978. Okay, there's a, quite a time lapse between the two. So that guy, oh, it disappeared. It didn't stay, okay? 57, 54, we still use it today for structure. It stays. 52, 51 is still used somewhere in Europe. And then Alcoa in 1978 introduced a pair of uh, things, 6009 and 6010, 6010 for the outer, 6009 for the inner. And that was used, General Motors used it, Ford decided not to use it. I'm still trying to understand why Ford went with 2036, General Motors with 6009, but we'll figure that out at some point. But uh, General Motors was way more audacious than Ford. They had four other models that used aluminum. We just tried, you know, tentatively with just a small production model. 2038 was an attempt to make 2036 last longer, it didn't work. 6111 came out in 1980, it went on the Humvee for the first time. And then uh, the 6014 appeared, and I'm going fast. Now 6016, this is a granddaddy of all of the body sheets used in Europe and everywhere worldwide. And it uh, appeared in mass production, sort of, on the 86 Volvo 740 wagon or estate, as they call it in Europe. And then 2008 was Alcoa's answer to, uh, to, to something that they thought would please us. Uh, we won't go into the detail. We used it for one part, and then, oops, it went away. And then uh, 6022 appeared from Alcoa. That was a better solution, and it went on the 1995 Concorde. And then 2010, that was the last gasp effort on the 2000 series before it went away. And then 6005 modification, in the, then, and then 6451. And here we are. We left with the alloys that we use today. And so skins and all of those, as I said, this is uh, are all low copper, what I call low copper. The floors in 57, 54, are, are, you know, and the door in those use 5,000, but basically in the world today, all, everything which is outside is 6,000, and the floors and, and, and the small things that don't require too much strength are 5,000. Ford loves 6111. I mean, 6111 for us is a magical alloy, and one day we'll tell you all about it. But we love it, and, but we use it no longer for skin. We use it for structural application, and many of them, we use a uh, proprietary high-speed heat treat system, and we get close to 300 megapascal, and that's very, very useful when you're making a truck. Tesla is actually a volume user of high-speed blow-forming 5083 parts that are made right here in Quebec. Okay? Uh, European manufacturers still using 5251 for some hoodiness and other things. And then higher strength 6000 series are trying to, to, to pierce through, but you know, there are things that as alloy makers you don't understand, but us as tool makers really know is that high strength alloy as, an, as a high strength as an incoming str strength is a very, very bad thing for us. We like to get things soft and we like them to gain strength later because if you have a high strength incoming, you can't make them. 
it's very difficult to make them. Spring back is a terrible thing. At 7,000 fairies, I know a lot of people are talking about 7,000 series, but these are expensive exotic things. Remember, the aluminum high volume, I mean, the automotive high volume business is a low cost business. It's cost driven, and we want to have processes that are simple to run and processes that are low cost. And anything that has to do with heat, you have all kinds of specifications that you need to meet then from a quality system. It's a very different ball game, and you have put all kinds of equipment and things, which is not always nice. Plus, the lubrication at 500 degrees C, I'll let you think about what that means, to lubricate things that are that hot. So, the scrap flow. Two sources uh, alluded to the first one, the prompt scrap, right? And so it's the stuff that is coming directly when we manufacture. It's tied to aluminum consumption and therefore to aluminum production. And most of the mills that supply us are actually in the US proper. There's one mill in Kingston from, from uh, Novellis, but the rest is in the US. The end of scrap, on the other hand, is a much more complicated picture. And that's what I was trying to understand. And it's tied to vehicle sales. And it includes the import, so metal comes into the United States as an import, but vehicles leave the United States as export. People forget the United States exports vehicles too. I mean, it's not just simply for internal consumption. We're just not just a passive actor on the world scene. We export things too. So trying to understand that was a project that prompted me to, it interested me. So the first challenge, and this is shared with both the, the prompt scrap and the end of service, is composition. And if you look at this chart I have here, the manganese, magnesium, and then copper silicon, I'm using those charts, this is my chart, this is how I like to put it, but it allows me to highlight the difference between 5,000 series and 6,000 series. And if you think about all of those, and if you think about how the Aluminum Association defies those boxes, which is the Aluminum Association definition, uh, you notice that there is really no compatibility at all. I mean, you can't mix any of those things together, and you arrive into that you actually would like to have to sort things by alloy, which is absolute nonsense, right? We can't do that, and, and that's very difficult. Iron contamination, it's a huge deal, especially if you're trying to do a prompt, I mean, a closed tolling loop like we have at Ford, where we cycle metal between the plant and the mill two to six times a year. You can't accumulate iron. I mean, try to take iron out, it's difficult, especially on the scale we're talking about. So the problem and the prompt scrap level is that a standing plant is not a neat clinical environment. It's actually a monstrous job shop. And the stamping line are enormous fixed machines. The scrap handling system is a very large fixed investment as well. And then we have tools that cycle in and out that make different parts. And all of that is in an environment in which most stamping plant work both steel and aluminum, and usually a majority of steel and a little bit of aluminum. And it's complicated. It means that since you have a single scrap system, if you want to, to run aluminum, you have to remove the aluminum from the steel because you can't sell the steel back if it has aluminum in it. It shorts out the electric furnaces, and, and you lose a lot of money. And you, can't, you have to, to remove the steel from the aluminum because you actually want to get value from it, and, and you don't want to have too much iron. But this requires investments. And the problem with the auto industry is that they don't do investments in what the outside folk would think is a rational way. We don't do investment based on the global vision for the company, because there is no global vision for the company. There is, but not really as far as manufacturing is concerned. And, and what they do is that each car program has to support its own investment. So if the focus wants an aluminum hood, and it's going into plants that don't have aluminum, if you want to sort the aluminum out of the steel, your focus has to support the investment for each plant in which it is the first aluminum user. It doesn't matter that Fiesta might follow with another one later. Usually we don't know that, and focus doesn't know that Fiesta is going to do it. And the people who know are not interested in cross-funding the two things. Okay? So it means that you... And, Things are distributed worldwide in many different places, and it is complicated to get investment to actually get that placed. And the funny thing is, and the nice last thing is that aluminum application, why do we use boltons? It's because we can remove it when we don't need it. We use aluminum only if we're forced to. And it means that application come and go, and they move from one plant to the next. And so making investments that are expensive investments into plants that are only where the metal is just a minority participant is difficult and 
it's not really good. So one example on how we did it right, there was a moment of lucidity at Ford when we decided to go and do an all aluminum F-150, and we realized that if we did the F-150, we were doing the F-350, and if we were doing the F-150 and the 350, we were doing the expedition and the navigator, uh, the team sat down and said, people, we're gonna have to do this right. And we actually convinced the higher ups all the way to the, to the CEO uh, to actually fund the necessary investment covering all three programs. And we got money ahead of time from the F-350 to cover the investment for the F-150. And when we looked at F-150 and 350 expedition, we went, well, expedition, you know, just a small volume, you'll just ride along. And so we, we were able to do that. We were allowed to put this marvelous uh, scrap handling system in all the plant and the investment that we needed. We were able to expand it later to most, but not all of Ford's stamping plants. We created, and that was my, one of my contributions, was to create specifications that were from the get-go uh, dedicated to include scrap recycling, so that we would be able to commingle multiple alloys and for multiple supply and return them without having to sort by alloy. We, we have a very sophisticated scrap management system between, well, say we, I don't have we anymore. Ford has a very sophisticated management system and we were able to dedicate two plants to aluminum. Think about it, two stamping plants entirely dedicated to aluminum. It helps a lot. It eliminates the iron contamination issue once and for all, and it, it really helps. All of the other stamping plants that do aluminum are limited to only two scrap stream, so that it allows us to minimize the investment, and all of our tier ones, we limited to either one or a maximum of two scrap stream as well, and we consolidated all of the outside sourcing to as few suppliers as possible so that we could rationalize the investment. That was a, quite an achievement. And then all of the, uh, this means that this is the scrap flow from Ford. If you look at it, what we buy, 52% of it goes on wheels in the US, 10% is actually exported. 5% okay? goes to the secondary market, and 33% loops two to six times a year between Ford and the mills, okay? I put 67% is primary or other because I don't know where they get the metal to make, the, to make up what we don't uh, toll that's internal to the aluminum companies and they don't really like to talk about it, so I'll let them figure it out and if you have questions, go ask them. But this is what Ford is able to do and that is unique in the world. And why it is unique? People do toll back, but we're the only one who toll back without any secondary processing. The truck leaves the plant with the scrap, it goes straight to the mill, it, the, it empties itself in the, uh, the bunkers that have the scrap at the mill and it is reused without any intermediary processing. Okay? So this is what is outstanding, this is my greatest personal achievement, <laughs> is to be able to set this up and make it work. Okay? It was incredibly complicated, extremely painful, and, but it's worth it. Ford saves an absolute fat mountain of money because of that. So geography is my third handicap. So here I have the map of the United States and actually uh, NAFTA. And you can see what I call the northern consumers up here. I'm not going to uh, go through them, but you see we have a nicely clustered. Why do I break them in between north and south? It's because if you're doing 6,000 series, being north or south has a very large importance of logistics and actual shelf life of the material. But it also to highlight that the production is moving south, okay? The United States and NAFTA and all the global OEM, because the North America is actually a footprint, a base for global OEM production. And people are moving all the way into Mexico, and you can see they're moving west and everything. So you have a lot of production that is actually what I consider in the south of the United States. And where, is the aluminum, where are the aluminum mills that actually support all of this? Well, they're in red here. And forget the dot in San Antonio, it's a tiny little place on a continuous casting from Alcoa. It's a very interesting place, but it, it's a really minor player in the big scheme of things. And you see where all the cluster of the production is concerned. So if you think about it, when you have production in here, it's a long way to go back to Mama, right? And so tolling back all the way there is a problem. And it has consequences. So, which brings me to my next point. The next challenge for prompt scrap and scrap in general, because of course you see in the production and consumption, but if you think about end of service, we don't sell vehicle only in the Midwest, right? We sell vehicle everywhere in, the North, in North America. And there's a lot of sales in the, on both coasts away from where the material is produced. And therefore vehicle are going to die on both coasts, right? So the infrastructure is useful. So only right now, Ford is the only one tolling directly. Everybody else, 
all the rest of the metal, and the consumption is growing dramatically, meaning that they need to have the material process. Somebody will need to do some form of processing. Chrome scrap is expanding as a function of the usage, and I'm using Ducker here, even if I think that maybe his 2020 forecast is more optimistic than mine. But 235,000 metric tons, plus or minus 25,000 in 2015, this jives with my numbers. It's surpassed, so it should jive. And I know how much Ford sent back and told back, and it tells me that 145,000 went into processing and, uh, and the billeting at market. In 2020, if I believe Docker, and I use Docker's computation and everything, I work the numbers, it's about 620,000 metric tons that are going to go as prompt scrap. And of this, approximately 470,000 tons will escape the Ford system. And they will require some form of processing. So think about it. 470,000 metric tons of prompt scrap that will need some form of processing in 2020. And when is 2020? It's only two years from now. Right? So you think about it. The processing on top of it needs to be close to the consumption, and that means close to the OEM, which means that some independent processing folks are going to be, will need to invest stuff. These people have no idea that they need to do that, because nobody has been telling them. Right? And that's the difference between what I thought I would talk about and what I'm talking about right now, okay, when I saw the numbers, when I did the numbers. So why are we doing this scrap valuation? It's because, of course, cost. Remember, the auto industry is, is a margin, profit margin that are puny. We don't make 100% profit margin. We make like 5%, 6%, 7% profit margin. And we're happy when we make that kind of money. Nice thing is that, of course, we don't buy a pound of aluminum for every pound of steel. We save weight. That's why we do it. So, of course, it's less horrendously expensive than it looks like. But for an accountant at Ford or General Motors or Toyota, this is still absolutely horrendous. Why the hell would you do that? So the nice thing is that prompt scrap is actually worth a whole lot more than steel scrap, up to eight times more, right? So savvy OEMs use it to offset the aluminum premium. And we can ship this little a little bit out of it, right? So it is important to maximize the prompt cap value, and we can't afford to let this, the sale of the scrap collapse because one of the legs that support the use of aluminum body sheet is going to disappear if we don't support it. So challenges, incompatible compositional limit, iron segregation, geography, and infrastructure. Okay? These are the major challenge facing the industry in general, and people have no idea to do this. I've talked, I participated in talks with various OEM outside Ford, nobody really talks about that. And they are all convinced that the secondary market can accept their sale and that their price on the secondary market will beat what Ford will get. They have no idea what Ford gets, by the way. Okay? So if I look in the future, we said, like I said, the prompt crop grows with the production, but end of service is basically aluminum on wheels. And it stays on wheels for a long time. So let's try to understand how long it does and, and what happens with that. So stealth, as I said, people, when was the last time you went to a dealership to buy a car and you said, I want a car that has an aluminum hood. Show me every car that has an aluminum hood. Right? Is it a question that you ask? Of course not. Nobody knows that we put aluminum. Why? Because we don't want you to know. It's irrelevant to you. It's an engineering solution to a problem that you don't need to know about. What you're interested in is what the car does for you, or how it looks, or whatever. But you're not interested in what the car is made out of. Most people are not, at least. I'm, I like what the car is made out of. I'm interested in that. But OEM are not really involved in the end of service in North America. There is no environment that prompts us to, to, to get involved. End of service is distributed among many, 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 many actors, right? You have the people who uh, you know, take the car when it's done, you have people who dismantle it, the people who scrap it, the people who sort the scrap, people who move the scrap, sell the scrap. I mean, you have all of these people involved. They have no idea because nobody has ever told them that there was aluminum body sheet on cars. I've interviewed people and asked them. They have no idea that the cars they process have aluminum. They know that they have aluminum blocks, they have aluminum wheels, they know that they have aluminum transmission cases and things like that, but they do not know that they have precious, beautiful aluminum body sheet on those vehicles. Okay? So what happens is that all this aluminum body sheet is commingled. 
and it ends up with the rest of the aluminum scrap. Right? Tremendous loss of value, because if you know how much we pay for aluminum body sheet and what we could get out of it, to the idea that it ends up making gutters or making you know, the lower class thing, it downcycling is disheartening. But it's also extremely foolish, because it means that a large volume is now escaping attention. So what is it? So I wanted to figure out how large was that volume. I just had, because if you think conceptually, if you're under steady state condition, Right? I'm putting aluminum into a system, then the system keeps it for a certain amount of time, that's the time, the time you keep the car, right? and at the end the car goes away, then it comes out of the system, and if you had steady state, what comes in must come out. And since we use most of the sheet that we buy, my original assumption was that the end of life, end of service flow should be quite considerable. Right? So, I wanted to understand it. So what I did is that I constructed my own database of every vehicle that had an aluminum body sheet in the US since 1992. It's a, it was a monumental effort. It has kept me busy for a long time. And it's helped because for all the time I was at Ford, I was in charge of keeping a database of which competitors had sheet, right? So that I would know this. And I kept it not, not as an official database. It was something as I did for a hobby for all the presentation that I did because it's not the first time I talk about aluminum, right? So I have a lot of information, but also have a lot of friends. And then the internet is quite useful and everything. So I found a lot of in, all the information. The internet is fabulous to find car sales. There are lots of sites that give you exact car sales by model. I, used, uh, I did, couldn't go back to everybody and tell them what the 19, uh, 1993 model uh, hood weighed. So I, I know the size of the cars and I assumed, you know, based on size, how much components would weigh. Uh, I extrapolated the sales and added the known program to 2020. And I, then I constructed scrapping information. We, it's an entirely talk to talk about that. I won't talk about it today. But my goal was simply, remember, it's not an exact definition. So don't think that my numbers are the ultimate answer. They're just a quantitative comparison between prompt scrap, which is fairly good uh, understanding, to the end of service scrap. Okay? It's just trying to quantitative and try to understand how things work. So this is the US car market in 20, uh, up to 2016, between 20 years from 1996 to 2016. And it's, of course, an eye chart. I couldn't help it. This is when everything went bad in 2008, right? And you see that we have been climbing back up. But if you think about all of this accumulated hollow here, it means that cars have been getting older, which is verified by that. And the problem is that if you take these volume here and this there, and you take the accepted sales, uh, accepted life expectancy of cars, the two don't match. I'll just leave you with that thought. There's, a, there's many PhD theses there available to study. You should work on that, okay? People talk blissfully about that, talk about that. The two absolutely don't match with the life studies that exist out there, okay? I, I tried it. I, 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 gave, I used every model that I could find, nothing fit. So I had to do my own. I won't tell you what I found because that's not that important. By brand in the US, people talk domestic, but if they talk about by brand, uh, I'm a little bit more forward thinking that our leadership here, and uh, uh, we actually make close to 8 million cars in the US. Canada and Mexico, which are truly still our friends, right, uh, make an approximately 4 million as well. And then we do import outside of, of NAFTA, we do import approximately 4 million uh, vehicles from outside the United States, right? This is from a, a, a paper that CAR, the Center for Automotive Research in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, created to answer the White House first claim for that we needed to you know, tax everything and put uh, things. It didn't seem to have much impact. But it was a useful reference document. If you, if you want to look at it, it's very well done and it's very, very informative. Other aspect of the US market, the exports, again, from a NAFTA briefing by CAR, we export approximately seven, three quarters of a million cars to Mexico and Canada and then we export 1.3 million cars to the rest of the world, which is actually quite, quite impressive, and I had not realized it was that many. Aluminum sheet enters the US market from the outside, and it comes primarily, it comes from Europe, because the Asian uh, market does not carry much aluminum body sheet, but the Europeans have lots of luxury brands, and they import a lot of aluminum with it. And then, and, and then another thing that people don't quite realize is that some American um, car manufacturers actually import aluminum sheet. Uh, there's one that imports from China, I won't name them. Uh, there's some others that we are forced to import from Europe because we're using European aluminum producers who are trying to launch mills in the US 
And in between this awkward period between what you promise and reality, they actually have to fill the gap with metal from Europe. Okay? So we have had metal coming in from Europe. So the conclusion of that is that you can't use any of the information that the Aluminum Association would like you to believe is useful to understand that. You actually have to understand where the damn metal comes from. So on wheels, general trend, this is what it looks like. This is my numbers. And basically by 2020, we have accumulated about 2.5 million tons of aluminum that are circulating on the US market. And we're growing by 2020 at the rate of around 400,000 metric tons per year. Think about it. We add 400,000 metric tons of aluminum on American roads every year after 2020. Where it comes from, if you look in 2012, it was about 10%, a third of the total. But if you look, oh, you can barely see the pale blue here, at least from my angle. Can you see the pale blue on top? Yeah, well, the pale blue goes all the way here. <laughs> and here it was only around here. Okay? And so uh, this is, if I look at the end of service flow, you can see the delay. This is if production stopped in 2020, and there suddenly was no more aluminum sheet in the market. If you watched it disappear and dissipate in the end of service, this is what it would look like. And so the, the, there's a substantial delay. If I expanded it for 20 years and assumed steady flow for another 10 years to 2030, you can see what it looks like, and you can see how important the actual inflow is to the outflow. Okay? So the summary is that in, in 2017, new on wheels was approximately, well, I mean, in 2017, the end of service flow was approximately equal to the on wheels flow in 15 years earlier. 40,000 metric tons of aluminum sheet passed through the end of, sort of the scrapping industry last year, and they had no clue. And 60,000 metric tons will pass through it by 2020. Design, early hood was mostly unialog. We abandoned all of that, and so it was complicated. If you look at the F-150, the hood and the fender are unialog, bolt-ons. The doors is much more complicated. The red things in here, this is a door in us. These are 5182 high magnesium. The rest here is low magnesium. This is low copper. And if you look at it, uh, you have even boron steel. And then you have little reinforcement and crap that you have to deal with. And you see steel many different places in the car. You see it here. You see it in the dash panel and etc. If you look at the Audi, this is the third generation Audi. The only thing steel in the third generation was this, but look at all the casting and the extrusions that were in it. It makes complicated. Look at the fourth generation. Oh my God, it gained 51 kilos because a lot of steel has come into that car, right? It's no longer an all aluminum car, it's a steel car. It's similar now to the Cadillac CT6, where the orange is the steel and the gray is the aluminum. If you look at it, again, lots of casting, lots of extrusion. Uh, the closures are aluminum, the skins are, of course, are aluminum, but lots of mixed material. Joining, I won't go through, but we basically join with using steel fasteners, and those are a problem, and uh, yield loss, because if you scrap a vehicle and you shred it, you will not break the fasteners from the metal. They will come out with aluminum chunks attached to it, and if you look at how many of those there are in a vehicle, you can get, imagine that they're between like 3 or 6% of yield loss, yeah, like just because of that. No ready market, I alluded to that. Nobody is thinking about that. There is no market, which means that there is no quality standards for this end of service crap. There is no material specs for the end of service crap. There is no incentive to do anything about it. And so the OEM are not involved, the aluminum industry is not involved, and basically we left to market forces. So the summary, we have a fragmented consumption and production environment. We have mixed metal, mixed alloy plants. We have fragmented design environment. We have little or no infrastructure to handle it. And at the end, we have absolutely no infrastructure, either engineering-wise or facilities-wise. By 2020, we might have more than 600,000 metric tons of prom scrap a year entering the secondary market, of which at least 450,000 tons will need to be processed. End of scrap at that period will be another 60,000 tons. And these volumes mean that you cannot upcycle it, and if we don't recycle it, we will downcycle it. And that could really collapse the market. So left to market forces, the risk is a collapsing of the downcycle market, and it will be a degradation of the financial offset that the car companies are counting on to support the use of aluminum. So that could actually remove one of the legs that aluminum sheet stands on for its growth on the market. Okay? So it is 
very important that we actually pay attention to it, but nobody is. Okay? And, of course, let's not forget why we do this. We're doing this because we want to eliminate CO2, right? We want to uh, energy equation and everything. And if I can't tell people as an OEM that I'm recycling it, it's not a great story for the life cycle analysis, is it? So that's my end. Any questions?